Well, welcome to our Super Dennis Boost Hypothon. Our Super, Super Dennis Boost Practice Owner Edition is going to be amazing. If you want to come in person, my team will drop it in the comments. Text Boost to 215-543-6454. If you would like to watch online for free, we are offering that until July 4th. Then you got to pay. Dennis, I know how to get them, Darcy. They're very dentist cheap. They'll go on $8,000 vacations, but don't want to pay eight bucks for CE. So I know them. So I'm going to offer this for free until July 4th. So Dr. Darcy, thanks for being here with me. You've been on so many awesome Nacho TV shows. You're going to be a speaker at Super Dentist Boost. But I want to start off with this question for you. What is something they don't tell you about practice ownership that they really should tell you about practice ownership before you sign on the dotted line to take out that loan? And have that practice, Darcy, longer than your children will live in your house. You will have a dental practice most of the time, I'd say over 90% of the time, longer than your children will live in your house. So tell us, what is something they don't tell you about that, Darcy? A scary thought. You just got my wheels turning on the <laughs> kitchen. Um, no, but I think that you own a business. Like, and there's more to it than just being a dentist. You actually have to run a business and that it's not just numbers and doing all of those behind the scenes things that are not super hard to learn, but the people part of it is the, the hardest part to learn. So think just that you have to actually own and run a business and be a dentist. You have to wear all of the hats and you don't get to take them off. There's no one to pass the buck to. I love that. Can we actually not your team? Can we get a bunch of hats for Super Dennis Boost? And Darcy and I will put them all. I want a fedora, a Phillies hat, uh, a, a winter hat, because it's so true when you say it there. Oh. I'm super into the story, the story being the star. Now tell us, mm. let's just go through the dental school way. When did you graduate from dental school? 2014. 2014, where'd you go? Tufts. Tufts. And what did you do your first year after school? I worked. Work. How did you find that job? Um, I actually just networking through people that I had already known um, within the dental world in New Hampshire, because I was connected before dental school and through dental school to different uh, dental organizations through other things that I had done prior. So just through friends, I had found the opportunity, um, which was really nice. So I, I that, that's awesome. Being all ABC, always be connecting. I want to deliver so much value. So the other day we were sitting at Nacho headquarters and we are currently offering the time this recording, our dental Nacho CE program, which includes the boost that you went to two years ago. It's $3.99 for the year, but we are offering it, Darcy, to dental students and new grads for $39.90 for the next 30 days. Tell us, go from dental school to your first job. I, what were you afraid of? What were you worried about? What was you like, oh, geez, I show up. I don't know if this is going to happen. Give us some of the fear factors of going from the dental school environment into private practice. Um, I It was a little different for me than I think might be for some people because I walked across the stage um, at my graduation with a three week old in my wow. hand. So um as a new mom going into dental practice, my my first concern was that balance. And it was also paying bills because I was taken care of through unfortunately relying on the living expense part of dental of dental school loans, of, of student loans. And now all of a sudden it's, I have a child and I need to find work. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it because I didn't, I chose not to do um, any type of residency. So it, it made it a little bit more difficult to find a position. Um, my So my first thing was I need to pay my bills. I need to find a job. The second was, how am I going to balance this with where I'm at in life right now? Um, and then the third was, you know, do I even know what I'm doing? Am I going to have the person to really like hold my hand and show me the ropes? Because there was a part of me that really knew the stuff that I didn't know. Um, even though you kind of sometimes graduate a little overzealous with the things yeah. that you do know, right? They sometimes so. give you unrealistic confidence in what's going to happen in the real world. And what I pointed out, I just had an opportunity to speak to a lot of residents and whether you go from your residency to the real world or dental school to the real world, this is a really important point. 
Every single patient you see is new to you. Every single patient does not trust you. Every single patient does not know you. So your work gets slower because you have to spend the time developing relationships. Practice owners don't get that. So you go into this private practice and, you know, I, I just came from the gym. Darcy, you probably tell by how jacked I am. But um, I think of like your dentist self as working out. So we got clinical skills, business skills, patient communication skills, operating in a dental office skills, go to private practice associate Darcy. If you were talking to a new mom and a new associate right now, what skills would you tell them to work on? What skill would you tell them to exercise to help with their survival and thrival as a new associate in either private practice or DSO? Honestly, just being likable. Like yeah. communication. Like people really don't know how good their filling is. They don't really, they have no idea, but what they do remember is how you make them feel and the experience that you give them. That doesn't only apply to your patients, it applies to the team you're working with. Um, so really just being likable and being able to communicate with people and see people for people. And I, I love that tip. Please pull that out. And I mean, it's, I, I used to have a course, I'm a dentist now, I said, there's only two ways to succeed be like, yeah. be credible. So when you're 27 years old, you're not credible. You wouldn't trust you. Right. I love yeah. when, I love when a new dentist say things like if I work at a practice, like well, it to do the really difficult cases, I go, would you pay you to do veneers on yourself? And they go, oh yeah. So get good at fundamental dentistry, describing fundamental dentistry. I talk a lot about wording instead of saying a tooth fails, says it, re says it retires. Don't be weird and call teeth virgins on a Tuesday at 10 30 AM to a 78 year old woman say tooth without a filling. So I love it. So you're in your associate's how many years were you there before you became a practice owner? Um, I was there, I had two different associateships. Um, my first associateship, I was there from 2014 to 2017. Awesome. Um, and then the end, towards the end of 2017, I worked in the office that I ended up purchasing as I started as an associate first, but it wasn't full time. So I ba actually balanced that with working at a hospital in a healthcare oh, cool. clinic. Um, so it was what, 2014 to 2020, I was six years. Am I so doing that? Six and years. So you probably learned a lot about what you'd want to do as an owner, stuff you didn't want to do. I have a good question for you. Um, and this goes for parenting and practice ownership. I know you don't have an associate yet. Job Connect one day is going to help you get one when you're yes. at uh, Dennis Job Connect. We have a dentist flying across the country right now to see yeah. one of our positions in Philadelphia. So Dennis Job Connect is bonding dentists together. But Sometimes when you're an associate, you get frustrated with a practice owner. I don't know why they do it this way. If I was a practice owner, I would not do it this way. But now that you're a practice owner, would you maybe go back to your associate self and say, dial down the drama a little bit? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And what makes you feel that way? What do you learn as a practice owner and be like, man, I didn't know that this is how it was. And as an associate, I probably should have been a little more mentally flexible and things like that. Tell us something like about that it's just it's not all about one person there's just so many there's so many moving parts and you cannot make everybody happy and do it everybody's way and just realizing that there really is there's certain things within a practice that there is no one way to do it like as long as you get from point a to point b there is a multitude of ways to get there um, there's certain things within that, that like for me as a practice owner, it's, this is the way to do it. This is the New Hampshire smile company way. There is no wavering, but it's really not a whole lot. It's just a handful of, of processes. Um, so, and knowing that you just can't make everybody happy. Yeah, so yeah. I, I have a good one for you. I, I have a good tip for <laughs> talk. Make sure you get some good pictures for Instagram for Darcy and tag us. You know, parents talking about practice ownerships. Now I didn't know this. By the way, Darcy was a new mom and a new associate. So we talk about new moms and practice owners. Mm. We talk about new parents and new careers too. But I do this, Darcy, and this happens, you know, dental business, nacho business, dentist job connect. I could do something like this. And my team will probably laugh. I'll go, hey, everybody. Maybe on the day after Thanksgiving, we should be off and substitute another day. And someone goes, that's my Pilates championship. And I go, calm down. Don't be so A-A-Y. And I call it all about you. And being A-A-Y yeah. derails conversations. Let's talk as a team. 
And then we can make a good decision. We respect your Pilates championship or that you're going to be out for Black Friday for 25 out of 24 hours yeah. a day. And I think associate dentists, and I want to call this out in a, in a supportive but realistic way, it's because you just rely on yourself in dental school. It's all, you're all by yourself. You take the patient to pay. You, you do all the procedures. And then now you're part of a team. And it's not easy to do that. And the other thing I'll share is um, I, had, I was an associate for my dad and his partner for a short time. And I thought, oh, man. I produced two thousand dollars, and like they only paid me seven hundred dollars. That's thirteen hundred dollars. They must be so rich off of me. And the realistic thing is, you make like ten yeah. percent off your associate yeah. if they do a good job. So, it, associates, you are not the cash cow or golden goose that you think. Now, you're definitely contributing to the success of the office. But I'm glad that you kind of were able to reframe that. So now you go through your associateships. And you did the thing, Darcy, which I think is awesome. You bought into the practice where you were an associate. So is, is this true? So yeah. tell us about that process because you got to see the practice. Tell us how you made that decision. Um, huh, that's a fun, that's actually a really fun question. Um, so I had, I had fallen upon this practice while I was in my other associateship craving more mentorship. So that was really how I ended up jumping ship from one associateship to another was, realizing I needed that mentorship. Um, Tell us a little more about what mentorship means, because I think a lot of new um, say, I want mentorship. I go, cool, cool. What's mentorship? Yeah. Go, I got no idea. What men- so what did that yeah. mean? It's really good for you because you were an associate for three years. Was it clinical case acceptance management? I'd love, we'd love to hear that. So for me, I know mentorship can be, you can define that in so many different ways and, and there's different ways that you can mentor someone. For me, I wanted a mentor where I could learn other ways to do the things I was already doing, realizing, okay, when I find myself in this pickle where I can't get the stupid little, you know, you call it the little class two thingy through the tooth or you get the wedge in, but it's not closing off the gingival margin because, you know, they've had, they've had perio. Um, involvement. You're like, how do I get this darn thing closed and contoured? And just like I, I wanted somebody who had more experience than me that I could ask those questions when I ran into it to say, what do you do for this? Yeah. And I love, I love that, Sharon. I want to interrupt uh, an amazing tip. So if you are a practice owner or an associate, this is a very important question to ask on every job interview, whether you've been a dentist for a day or 10 years. How often will I be the only dentist at the practice? So Dentist Job Connect team, make sure on an interview, when you're interviewing, could be with a DSR group. If you're the only dentist at a practice, Darcy, it can be very lonely. Is that, I mean, now even as a practice owner, it can be lonely. Yeah, I've been, I've pretty much been technically alone my entire career um, when, because my associateship was with a pediatric dentist. Um, so I was the only general dentist in the practice, um, and it was just me on my own, like in my own wing of the building. Um, and then even in my next associateship in the practice that I purchased, even though I got some mentorship, it wasn't really full hands-on mentorship because we worked opposite days most of the time. Um, so now I'm again by myself. So I've, the one good thing about it is it's forced me throughout my career so far to really plug into every opportunity that comes my way to connect with other dentists, um, to pick up the phone and ask them questions. To fly to Philadelphia for Jason Smith on a Sunday. Yeah, I mean, I you, you this just... Is a comfortable question, Darcy. How do you get better at something if no one better is ever there with you, right? Yeah, you can't. How good as far as a practice owner, you can be Dr. Todd Fleischman. And that's why I encourage him. And you do this. You go to a Jason Smithson course. You go to Spear. You sign up for Right Global. Yes, they're sponsors. So that you get someone pushing you to do better, lift heavier weights. And I think that's such a key part. So your your practice ownership start. That was 2020? Yes. And you practice or an associate. Let's make sure we don't make everyone not want to buy a practice. So I want to share... Like, watch this. What's the best part of being a parent? I mean, this morning, my daughter was screaming at me uh, to not make any jokes in the house. That's true, right? So I wouldn't call that yeah, the best. Yeah. Then saying, you know, wanting to be with her dad, going to place in Philadelphia, those are the best parts of, of be- parenting. What's the best part of practice ownership for you? The best part about practice ownership is uh, 
I had coined it in our last, you know, conversation uh, on a whim, but leading without hesitation yeah. Um, yeah. in so many different ways, being able not just to lead your team, um, but lead your business, being able to make those decisions. I think most of us get into dental ownership, like practice ownership, because we are those people who don't like being told what to do. I, uh, I don't like being told what to do. I, um, I also yeah. want to share. There's a chance I'll admit that I don't like there's it. There's a chance that we should get our own special therapist, for uh, them, right? We because, should. Like, well, we, we just yeah. We just, like we don't want anyone to ever tell us what to do. Never. No. Uh, a blue pen instead of a black pen. I'm like, we probably should see some, but I totally understand that he yeah. has the ability, like an awesome hair salon or an yep. awesome chef owned restaurant to create awesomeness for you and your team. So leading without he hesitation. Yeah. If we switch gears, because everything's the two sides to a coin, parenting, yep. practice ownership, you at a time were really frustrated with your practice, really yeah. You would maybe call it, would you call it an emotional challenge, an emotional crisis? How would you tell us, describe to you, describe to us this emotional challenge, crisis yeah. as a practice? You had made it. You got two kids. You got the dog. What, what kind of dog do you have again? Because I know it's not the golden doodle. It's a, a miniature dachshund. Miniature dachshund. Two yeah, miniature dog. Awesome husband. You bought into the practice. Everything must be perfect for Darcy. Yeah. Tell us what it felt like and what caused that challenge. It really, I call it my mental breakdown. I just, I hit a wall. I, for the first couple of years, just had buyer's remorse. Honestly, I, there were times I would come home and look at my husband, Kevin, and say, how do I, how do I get rid of this? Yeah, how, um, how do I, policies. Like I, I can, it's, you can, but it's, you can't. And so um, it really was, all of the things that come with with practice ownership, the people um, from patients to team, you know, where how I said you cannot make everyone happy and you have to and that, you, know, that, you have to be OK with that. But all of those pressures for me personally was getting to the point of not and being the only doctor as well. Right. I think had a lot to do with it is not feeling not feeling good enough for anybody. I, I and I hear the emotion of your voice. You describe it, and it's totally normal to feel this way because yeah. no one tells you this. And one of the things, and I just spoke with a dentist who is producing a million dollars a year and leaving dentistry this year as an associate because he said, and I admire him. He mm -hmm. said, Paul, oh, and his fiance is a dentist, and she's staying there. He said, I like to make people happy. I don't want to constantly delivering bad news to people, and dentistry yeah. is not for me. Now it doesn't mean for everyone to run out of dentistry, but that feeling. The patient yeah. happy, the team happy, uh, the clinic. So you're, what you're telling me though, Darcy, is you didn't want to return your practice because your crowns didn't have perfect taper, right? You weren't like, I can't do it perfectly. You didn't want to return your practice because you didn't know how to do a hygiene exam. Your main thing about buyer's remorse had to do with the managing of all the people and their problems and them looking to you and feeling isolated and alone. And that, mm -hmm. I'm so thrilled to be part of your journey uh, in helping make this less worse. One of the things I think dentists don't really embrace, Darcy, is they don't embrace less worse. I get calls. I get coaching calls. They have 15 problems. How do I make this better? I go, I don't know, but let's make it a little less worse, right? Even that goes for patients, right? They come after not seeing a dentist for a decade. Bone loss, bone shrinkage, teeth, teeth broken, cavities. How do I make this better? Let's start by making it less worse. So how did you start the journey to less worse? For, and I know I helped inspire this, but you, you deserve all the credit. But how did you start that journey? Well, I texted you, but. Um, and also, but, one of the things I talk about is FIPS, friend in your phone. OK, and it's so yeah. cute. you texted me. How did you have my cell phone number? You gave it to me. Yeah, when how, I, I think I got it. Geez, I think it was when I went to a dental. Yeah, so you came to uh, super this boost. Yeah. We give everybody boost buddies. So friends yeah. in your phone are key because you're having this crisis. And I'm going to text this guy who named himself after an appetizer, right? He's going to know what to do. And what did I say when you texted me? Um, It was a long text. So yeah. you took the time. Well, first you were like, I need to get back to you. Um, I'm doing some, but I'm, I'm thinking about you and let me carve this time out. Um, And then you were so good. You, you texted me, but you also called me. Um, you 
let me know you asked me what was really going on and um then you connected me with the people that i needed to get connected with so you put a post out on on the demo nachos facebook group asking um for resources for me as far as it, it was really the realization and and you pegged it really quickly is that you need you need a coach you need it you need to just i, I want to share darcy because mm -hmm. I yeah. I'm the I'm the person who's seen this before, so it doesn't throw me off. I say, "Oh yes, many dentists have come to this," and I knew you had more of a morale problem than a money problem. Yeah, if money is about to go out of business. I'm yeah. sure everybody they want their EBITDA to be better or make a little more money, but that was not the no. or the chief complaint. And when coaches came and said things, and you looked at this and you connected with Genevieve Poppy, you tell us about. You know, was it hard to get a coach emotionally? You know, you never had one before. Is it not just the financial investment, but also kind of saying, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. Tell us about that process of getting a coach because we're having a coach on next, Laura Brenner, who's awesome. So I just think whether it's a morale problem with your practice, wanting to leave dentistry, serious financial problems, family problems, there's this step of saying, I need help. And mm -hmm. then you connect to the person with help. Tell us about that with Genevieve. Yeah, so I had, I talked to multiple different coaches. Um, a lot of programs are out there and bigger consulting firms, and uh, that's not what I was looking for. So I connected with smaller uh, coaching um, businesses and more individualized to catering to what I needed, really, honestly, and who I connected with because it's somebody you have to trust, you have to work closely with. I wasn't looking to make more money, which I know ultimately when you get a consultant, just FYI, you do because yeah. they find the inefficiencies in your practice and help you weed those inefficiencies out from a production standpoint. But that's not that wasn't my sole purpose. So I wasn't going after someone who could promise to make me more money or any of that. It was how can I make your life balance with your practice better and be able to come in and weed out what it was that wasn't going right for me that I couldn't see and help correct that for me. So um, I connected with Genevieve most over that and it took me a while. Part of it too is the money part. We know dentists are cheap. There is a level two of dentists coming out of dental school. I was in a group of those where our debt is very high. So we have to balance that out if we had to do like I did. One and of the things, oh, I love this story and I want to interject with something that's helpful. I'm excited to talk to our next coach. This is how you should frame this. And I'm just going to use your practice bringing in $900,000 a year, right? Your practice, right? I know that's not what you're earning. What is the coaching investment? Two grand a month, three grand a month? What, what is it? Roughly. So I'm going to toot my horn a little bit. My practice brings in more than that. Okay. What's it, give us your total collections. Cause it's not total profit. Uh, 1.6. Okay. So this makes you even a little bit more dentist crazy in this environment. So your practice brings in 1.6 million. Yeah. And you have a morale problem. Yeah. And then someone like Genevieve says, Hey, here's your treatment plan. Just like we give the patients crowns, mm -hmm. billing, scaling, replaining. What was the investment in this treatment plan? Roughly. Um, it was, I think, $20,000. $20,000, right? So yeah. I want to share with every dentist now, you do to coaches and consultants what our patient does to us because your practice has $1.6 million in it. And you just have to take $20,000 to start yeah. removing your pain. And the sad part about it is, and I've talked with Dr. Amanda C about this. She's great. We don't have the right deserve factor, right? For some weird reason, we go, we don't deserve to invest this in our happiness. And I'm here to say you do because you you were you would have resisted your dentist frugality. You did it. You jumped over it. Who helped you? Yourself, Kevin, or you just had enough pain. So you get the bill. And many people get that that treatment plan, just like our patients for implants, Darcy. And they go, oh my gosh, it's too expensive. How did you agree to this treatment plan financially? I think honestly, just realizing needing to value, like really the value of work-life balance just exceeded any number that anybody could have thrown at me. Like it became such a high priority because the value became so great to me going through all of the crap that it was, I don't, I don't care how much it costs. I don't care if I don't make any more money. I don't care if it means I make less money if it means that my life is better. 
Yeah. And also, and I'm going to, and I'll reframe this. I'm sure you're such a great person to talk to. You paid about 1.3% of your yearly collections towards this. It's a really great deal. It wasn't expensive. It's like someone making $100,000 a year, not investing $1,300 in mental health therapy or physical yeah. fitness. So this is, think of your practice and the expense. So you working with the coach, what is the transformative power? What were some of the, for, you know, we have patients, they want to fix everything at once. We can't yeah. do it. But what did Genevieve start fixing first? She really helped start fix uh, dynamics for me, um, being able to recognize and have clear markers of accountability around every role in the practice, even for myself, um, and showing me ways to do that that didn't drive me crazy and that I could actually take hats off at that point, um, which was really nice. So it, it took a lot off of my plate and uh, drove accountability for my team. And, and I want to say, Darcy, I see these funny TikToks. It's like, and now some of these are classic gender roles, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wife saying my husband never helps me clean around the house. And they show the husband cleaning. They go, not that way, not that way. That's not how I do it. And the husband goes, I don't freaking want to help you anymore. Right. And yeah. I think coaches, sometimes you could pay a coach a lot of money, yeah, they be great, but you still have to release some control. Yep. I think it's it's on a road to recovery. I mean, honestly, you were basically on a road to recovery. But the mm -hmm. great part about this story is that you kept the practice you invested in, and now you feel different, right? So if someone just popped in and say, I'm talking with Dr. Darcy, mom, wife, practice owner, doing seven figures in collections and wanted to return her practice. She basically said, in her words, we're having a mental, a dental mental breakdown. We should use that, DMB. Because what's I care. Yeah. What and I am not a mental health professional. And I think it's awesome people get all types of help. And I want them to do this. Mm -hmm. Having a specific dental mental breakdown, right? This was specifically related to your dental practice, right? You, you weren't also trying to be the best CrossFit person in town while you were a dentist <laughs> doing this. This was your practice. So now if you just sort of said, I went from my dental mental breakdown, DMB, mm -hmm. to today, which is now like two years later. Yeah. How do you feel about your practice today? Describe to the, our audience how you feel as a practice owner after going through this transformative coaching. Yeah, I mean, it still has its hard moments. Don't don't get me wrong, but um, I wouldn't. I don't think I could see myself doing anything differently at this point. And I love being a practice owner. And I think a lot of it too. There are those little technical things, but it was also a shift in perspective for me as well. And so even though it still has its moments and stresses, uh, I, I love being a practice owner, but I, I can also see now uh, where I'm at, where it's also not meant for everybody. And yeah, and that's what I think is so key. I love Gary V. I live in a both end world. You know, I think it's awesome to be a parent. I love it. And I also see it super relaxing if you never have kids. I mean, you freaking just do whatever you want, whenever you want. What do you do with all your extra money? Do you spend it on the gronies? I don't know. And I see both and, right? And I see both and for practice ownership. I mean, there are associate positions on Dennis Job Connect, Darcy, where people are making $450,000 a year. That's why I can totally see never owning a practice if that's what you earn, because maybe yeah. that's not your style. So I see this both and So now talk to the not for everybody part about practice ownership, because I think there's a really bad theme and I'm mm -hmm. trying to unwind it, that if you don't own a practice, you're not successful. And yeah. if someone says they have a bad associateship, they say, buy a practice, right? I go, this person's six months out of school. How about we make better associateships? Yeah. So tell us the not for everybody part. They were sitting there at Boost with you this mm -hmm. summer saying, you know what? I could go either way, you know, and it could be, there's nothing to do with man or woman. My spouse makes $200,000 a year working from home. And I make $250,000 as an associate. And part of me wants to lead without hesitation. And part of me wants to do what you do, Dr. Darcy. But another part of me, I don't know if all the extra stuff's worth it. Tell us about that a little bit. The, I can see why people don't own a practice. Um, one, I think that if the only drive to own a practice is financial, then you shouldn't. Yeah. Um, because... You just, you shouldn't, I'm just going to put it right there. Yeah. If the only drive is financial and you think it's because I want to make more money, you should just stop right there. Um, but really, if you want to be, 
if you want dentistry to just be, this is what I do and not who I am, um, you shouldn't own a practice. There's a level of dentistry will never be who I am. It still is what I do, but being a business owner, being a practice owner, you never get to take that hat off. It is on 24 seven. So if you are willing and that is something that is desirable for you, and there's a lot of enjoyable things about owning a practice, but you have to understand that you are married to that practice and you, unless you sell it, you're on all the time and you don't get to take it off. So if that's the personality type that somebody has, and they're like, I'm good with that. And I'm driven and I'm motivated. And I have a better why to own a practice other than I just want to make more money, then go for it. But if you are someone that you want to take that hat off and you want to kick your feet up and not have to think about another patient or have to put out any fires over your time off. If you want to go to work, do your dentistry, go home, then you shouldn't own a practice. And I, I love it. You said a couple of things there. I want to a piece, uh, bring out, bring up Laura Brenner in a few minutes, but she has extra time and I'm sure she's enjoying listening to this. Mm-hmm. Gary V, you know, he gives all these great coaching things and people say, Gary V, you know, when do you stop worrying about your businesses, right? You made it, Gary V. When do you stop, right? You got $100 million. He goes, it's an easy answer. When do you stop worrying about your children? Never. And you're, it's. I actually think, Darcy, when you say married to a practice, I say this with authenticity, it's much easier to be divorced from a spouse than it is from a practice. Because mm-hmm. people, when I sell their practices, they're on their third spouse, their fourth house, one practice. So it's such a serious decision. I said it in the beginning, because when you sign up for a practice, you're going to likely have it for 25 to 35 years, likely. Mm-hmm. Your kids live with you from like zero to 18, right? I kind of wish mine lived longer. Now I'm going to convince them to come back and live with me after college, maybe. But I'm hoping longer. It's such a serious decision. You said it right. One of the things that I just want to call out that practice owners lie about, and even my own father, who is amazing, he would say, he never made me become a dentist. He said, do whatever you want, Paul, doctor, dentist, lawyer, whatever. I'm here to support you. He goes, but I really do like being my own boss. He goes, I like being my own boss. And he occasionally would say, I work 34 hours a week. But my dad lied to me because on Thursday nights, he would bring a briefcase home and do the payroll. And then on his days off, he'd meet someone at the office to talk about the compressor. And also thinking about your practice's work. So I will say, as I go see my friend, Dr. Todd Fleischman later, Todd spends his entire Friday just working on stuff for his practice. Case is this. So I will say that I think if you work, whatever you work, it's like double the hours of what you spend on your practice. And dentists just don't want to add that up. And like you said, it can be amazingly awesome, financially rewarding, personally rewarding. But what you said was perfect. If you want to do it for the financial part of it, it's the wrong reason to do it because there's easier ways to make more money. There's so many creative ways to be successful as an associate. And I want to champion practice owners like you, Dr. Darcy. And I also want to champion awesome associates that contribute to dentistry in whatever way they see fit. And there's one thing I want to share about practice ownership that is a total double-edged sword. You're part of your community, right, Darcy? People see you, they like you, the, you know, your family. My dad was the soccer coach. He was a Dr. Goodman. You know, I, people still say to you, your dad came in for an emergency when you were six and you were six in a chair. That's a total double-edged sword, being part of the community. Yeah. There's good parts and there's challenging parts. And here's the thing. It's good because people get to know you. People come to you when you coach soccer. People think of you as a resource. People think of you sometimes literally as the town here. Also, you can't turn that off and you can't move. You can't turn it off and you can't move. So when someone says it's very freeing to be a practice owner, I go, oh, cool. Can I move across the country? You cannot. So I just want to point out that awesome to be a pillar of the community, but awesome to be flex- awesome flexibility. So as we wrap up, Darcy, there's two things I want to ask you about. Okay. There is a dentist who one of our boost campers came when you were there. Her friend bought a practice, female dentist in PA and said, you got to go to boost camp. And I'm kindly annoying her because she said, Paul, it's Friday and Saturday. I want to come on Saturday, but I just bought this practice and I don't want to take off Friday. I don't want to miss patients. Tell her why she should shut down the schedule, come <laughs> to Philadelphia. She will not regret it. Whether it's for Jason Smith and whether for this, turn off their overachiever personality. Say to that person, if you can talk to her, Dr. Smith, take off her boost camp. You won't regret it because you did that. And why don't you? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the best investment you can make is in yourself. 
um, when it comes to our profession and owning a practice, especially. So it's just the same thing as when they say, you know, when you have a mom who ignores all the things that she needs to take care of her kids, but if you run yourself ragged, how, what good are you to the people that you're trying to help and take care of? You're not. So you need to take care of yourself in order to take care of other people well. So we have to keep that in mind when we own a practice is that you have to take care of yourself to take care of your patients and to take care of your team well. And the Nacho community has done that for me. I know it might not be for everybody, but I think that if she's already connected, she would be crazy to not come. Yeah. Well, um, it's like that friend who gives you the push to take the, to do something for yourself. Yeah, it's, it's like you saying, I did boost camp. You got to do it. And she's wonderful. Yeah. She goes, I can come Saturday, not Friday. But I said, the way boost camp works, we're kind of a team for two days. Yeah. We get to hang out. So I, uh, I will share, um, Many dentists say they regret not doing more in their career earlier like this. You can miss the day of work. Nothing happens. Those patients, half of them cancel sometimes on Fridays anyway. So Darcy, we're so excited to have you at Super Dentist Boost. You're going to be talking about this and more there, leading without hesitation, knowing your why, making authentic decisions about this amazing and annoying thing we call practice ownership. Uh, you've shared so much. If someone wanted to check out your practice website or Instagram, Darcy, how could they do that? So my website is nhsmileco.com. It is self-created, nice. so don't judge, but I'm in process actually of recreating it with Wonderist. So that's very exciting. I think that's awesome. Upgrading your website. You know, I have to share, Darcy, you look very nice for this. And I've seen you at these events and you don't usually wear sweatpants to our events. Not usually. Okay. <laughs> so I do want to share about, I will just jump in and I applaud you for upgrading it. Many dentists are way too cheap on their website and their yeah. website shows your awesomeness. So they'll use a lab that's like high end. They'll go to Spear. They'll, and then somehow they have a website that looks like when the internet was invented. You know, that's a Sebastian Maniscalco joke. So I applaud you because your website shows your awesomeness. So any smile co, any smile co oh, Yes, dot com. Any smile co awesome. How about your Instagram? Oh, that's so fun. I have no idea. Is it Darcy? It's like Darcy 20. Well, I have a, so I have a personal Instagram. So if you want my personal Instagram, yeah. it's, um, it's at, it's Darcy Ann. So I'm Southern Darcy Ann. Hello. Uh, 21. <laughs> awesome. Well, can't wait to see you in just, in just eight weeks here, Darcy. Thanks for taking this time out. You helped so many dentists doing this and we truly appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Darcy. Enjoy your Friday. Yeah, you too.